Well, good morning. It is good to see you here at Union Church of Manila, where we are united, maturing, and centered in Christ. And we are on our last week of our Dinner with Jesus series. We've been going through Luke for the last 10 weeks, and you are getting the tail end of this this morning. And we have a lot of ground to cover. Sometimes we uh, study one verse. Sometimes we study an entire chapter. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we studied just three, three words. This morning, we have 30 verses that we need to cover. And so we're going to jump right in. If you have a Bible, open up to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to look at a well-known story of the story of Emmaus. And, and really, it, it, it's not really a dinner scene. I, I'm, I'm fudging a little bit. It's more of a merienda. All right, where, where Jesus just breaks a little bread and he eats a bite of the fish. Does that constitute merienda? I don't know, but it's not a full-on meal. But uh, this is what he is going to do. And in this act, he is going to change his disciples' lives forever. So open with me to Acts chapter, or not Acts, Luke chapter 24. And let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we do invite you to open our minds to your scripture, open our eyes to see you and open our hearts and set our hearts on fire for you this morning through the teaching of your scripture in your name, amen. So let me set up the context here. The story is taking place after the death and resurrection of Jesus in this period of history. Now, Jesus is, uh, he's, as far as the disciples know, he is dead, all right, so the disciples are gathered in a room. In fact, it tells us in John chapter 20 that they are locked in a room. Now, why do you think that they're locked in a room? Well, it doesn't take a whole lot of intuition to understand why they are locked in a room. Their leader, the one that they have been following, the one that they have been promoting, the one that they have been talking about with everyone has just been executed for high crimes. And they are affiliated, and so they don't want to be affiliated with them. And so instead of being out on the streets telling people about Jesus, they are now locked in a room, 11 of them together, right? Effectively, just so you know, the Jesus movement is dead. Why is the Jesus movement dead? Because Jesus is dead. Doesn't that make sense? If you have a movement and the leader is dead, the whole movement would be dead. And so in their minds, the movement is dead. And this is where we find two individuals. One of them, is, their name is Cleopas, and the other one, we don't know their name, but they are on the road to Emmaus. They are getting out of Jerusalem, probably maybe even the cloak of night, trying to make sure that people don't see them, but they need to get away as quick as they can because bad things could happen to them. And while they're on the road, something traumatic happens to them. In fact, they meet the risen Lord. Look at what the text tells us here. If we look in Luke chapter 24, it says, in verse 14, it says, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. This is Cleopas and his friend, and they're talking about these things. They're walking down the road. Just picture them. I, I, I don't know what happened. I, you know, he died, and then other things that happened. People have talked about resurrection. What, what's going on? But while they are talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near. I don't know if he sneaks up on them, you know. I, I'm not sure how he drew near, if he came out of some place, but he comes near to them. And Jesus drew near and he went with them. And he starts walking with them. But notice it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, I don't know if it's because he's wearing a, uh, you know, a head covering of some sort and they can't recognize him or, you know, Jedi mind trick for you Star Wars buffs. I, I'm not sure if what it is that he's doing that they are not allowed to fully recognize who he is. And it says in verse 17, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Let me in on the conversation. And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? See, it was Passover time. There are lots of visitors in Jerusalem. Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem? He does not know the things that have happened there in these days. And he said to them, what things are you talking about? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death 
and crucified him. But notice this, what it says. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Now, what is their position now? They really don't believe he is the one who would redeem Israel now, do they? Why don't they believe that? We see that they're running away. We had hoped for it. It had been our longing. He had even said that he was the Messiah. And, and we had really believed that the Jesus movement was going to change everything. We had put all of our hope in it. But not so much. Now look what happens. It says, moreover, we had a little bit of hope. Some of our women and their company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And, and when they didn't find his body, they came back saying, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went up to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Next one. Notice at this point, we, we have all of these two disciples. The disciples, the 11 are huddled in a room, and the two are running away. There is disbelief, isn't there? In fact, if you back up in verse 11, look at what it says in, in verse 11 of the same chapter. It says, they were talking about the, the, the women had come and said that Jesus is risen, he isn't in the tomb, and, and look at what the disciples said. These words didn't seem to them, or it seemed to them to be an idle tale. They didn't believe them. Okay, so where are we here? We have 11 disciples who aren't believing, they're huddled in a room, we have Cleopas and his friend that are running away who are followers of Jesus who don't believe them. Now, Jesus is going to talk to them. He's walking along. And you think he's going to respond to them graciously and just say, oh, guys, I, I know it's hard for you to believe, but, you know, uh, I, I hope that maybe you can come and believe in this. And, and, and do you think he's going to do that? You know, Jesus, who is compassionate and loving, Notice his words to Cleopas and his friend. And he said to them, you fools. <laughs> what? Way to go, Jesus. Way to really rock their world. That world, aneotes in the Greek, means you are not thinking. Non-thinkers is the literal translation. You are non-thinkers. Any of you who have children ever say to your children, use your heads. Anybody ever say that? Am I the only one? Am I the only cruel parent? <laughs> I think that's what Jesus is saying to these guys. You non-thinkers. Why are you running away? Why are you not thinking? And then he goes on to say, and you're also slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You aren't thinking. Look, at, it even gives a description as to why they're not thinking. It says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And, and notice how he delineates this. He says, and beginning with Moses, the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, all the way to the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Keep in mind, he goes back to the word, and, and think about this. Jesus, from the time that he has met these gentlemen, has been telling them that the things in the past, from the law to the prophets, have been pointing to Jesus. And so he goes back to the non-thinkers and says, guys, get your heads together. Do I have to write it out? Do I have to draw you a picture of all the things that the Old Testament and the prophets were pointing to me, that I would die and that I would rise again? And, and, and notice what happens next in our story. The Bible says, so they drew near to the village that they were going. You would think that these two would be insulted, right? You're, you're calling us morons, basically. How dare you insult us and call us non-thinkers? They don't do that at all. Look, look at what they said. They get to the village where they were going. He acted as if they were going further, but he, they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it's towards evening and the day is far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. When he blessed the bread and broke it and gave it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized him. Jedi mind trick is gone. And, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And, and notice what happens next. After this encounter, do you think they, they stay in Emmaus? You know, they've gone all the way. They've walked all the way uh, to Emmaus. By the way, Emmaus is about 12 kilometers from Jerusalem. How long do you think it would take to walk 12 kilometers 
You know, they're walking, they're walking, kind of strolling, getting out of town as quick as possible. But notice, after this happens, they've walked all these 12 kilometers to this place where they're staying, and now, it says, and they rose that same hour after Jesus sees, or after they see who Jesus is, and they found, and they go all the way back to Jerusalem. Now, do you think they were just kind of strolling back to Jerusalem, you know? No, they're, they're running back to Jerusalem to the disciples who were huddled, huddled where? They're in a, behind locked doors, you know? And they go pounding on the door, and they found the 11 who were there with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, picture the scene. Jesus breaks the bread, and I don't know what happened in the breaking of the bread, right? So I, I, I try and picture this in my mind, but he breaks the bread, and I wonder if as he's handing it out, what, is, what do they see? Yeah, they could maybe see his wounded hands. I'm not sure if that's it, or maybe they recall as he's breaking the bread, what the, he told the disciples the night before, a couple nights before, right? This is my body that is broken for you. This is my blood that is poured out for you. I'm not exactly sure, but in the breaking of the bread, these disciples of Jesus, they move from running away in fear to running back to the heart of where persecution might be. Their lives are radically changed when they discover this Jesus. Now, let's keep moving on. By the way, stick with me. We got a lot of scripture up front and then we'll break it down at the end. So stay with me as we go through the scripture. So these disciples, Cleopas and his buddy, come back to the, 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 the room where the other disciples are, pounding on the door maybe. Yeah, let us in. And as they were talking about these things, I love this part. It says, Jesus stood among them and said to them, peace to you. He just shows up in the locked door. Now, now this is kind of interesting. I, you know, I've seen this in the Jesus film or I've seen it played out in different ways where Jesus kind of shows up just, and he's like, shalom, peace be with you. This here 12 guys, guys don't do it like that. You know, Jesus sometimes, he, 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 he makes his disciples a little fearful. This is how I see it. He shows up, sneaks up behind them and goes, ha, shalom. <laughs> Don't you, doesn't that more realistic? And notice what, I, that's why I think it says here, and they were startled and frightened and they thought they saw a spirit. Ah, shalom, what? <laughs> that's the Chad Williams interpretation of scripture, by the way. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. Verse 38, and he said to them, why are you so troubled? I can hear him almost say, I know, I, I te, a toss again. You non-thinkers. Why? And why are doubts in your heart? You're not thinking. See my hands and my feet? It's I myself. Touch me and see. For the spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Notice what else it says. And when he said this, he showed his hands and his feet. And while they, all of a sudden, now they believe, right? Does the Bible say they believe? No! <laughs> you know, he appears, they've got testimonies of the, of the women who have gone to the tomb. Peter talks about it. Cleopas talks about it. If Jesus is there. He shows himself. He shows his hand. You would think, get the clue, right? They still disbelieved. Look at verse 42. It says, but then, well, he says at the end of 41, he says, okay, here, here's where it gets real. Give me something to eat. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Light goes on. Fish goes in. <laughs> this guy's really eating now. Our most humanness is when we eat, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that our ending story ends with Jesus proving himself by a meal? Merienda. What a great message. Notice what he says to them after this. The Bible says that then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Look at what he does here. He goes back and he says, listen, again, what he said to Cleopas and his friend, right? 
The law talked about it. Moses talked about me. The prophets talked about me. The Psalms talked about me. I talked about me, that all of this was going to be fulfilled. You know, we can look into the Bible and in the Old Testament and see hundreds of references pointing ahead to the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah, and he says, guys, use your minds. I have been telling you this all along, that the prophets, all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to the end of Malachi, has been pointing ahead to me. And if you were using your mind, you wouldn't be huddled, you would be celebrating on this third day. In fact, look at what he tells them personally while he is alive. He doesn't even say it's just the prophets, but look at what I told you. Look at what it says in Mark chapter 9. He says, for while he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Is it any clearer than that? (laughs) I mean, really, that is as clear as it can be. uh, It's the third day, where are the disciples? They're hiding. What is Cleopas doing? He's running. It really didn't buy that. I didn't even think just a couple nights before. He takes the bread and he breaks it and says, this body will be broken. My blood will be poured out. He says, don't you know that the scriptures have been pointing to me all along? You foolish ones non-thinking. Let me tell you something. Part of being a mature Christian is being a thoughtful Christian. And thinking through your scriptures... Oftentimes there are believers that might just kind of want to get a little spiritual pick-me-up with a church service every now and then or sing a nice little song every now and then or go to a mass every now and then. But let me tell you, if that is the extent of your faith, you will live a very weak and huddled faith. And when things get difficult, you know what you're going to do? You're going to wind up huddling together. You're going to wind up living fearful lives. And you are going to wind up living weak lives. You know what makes you strong is knowing what is in the scriptures that validates, is validated in Jesus Christ. And when we know that, if the disciples knew that and they believed that, boy, on the third day, they would be at the tomb kind of just waiting there. It's almost time. It's almost time. Ready to go. But they didn't listen closely. They liked the experience of Jesus, but they didn't really care for the teaching that would change their lives. See, Jesus is not just this philosopher or just this nice religious figure. He brought them to the scripture that would point to him and and validate what he had done. And so many people in the body of Christ, I I think we're like those disciples that live weakened lives because we're not actively involved in the scripture. My question to you, are you actively involved in scripture? Are you becoming stronger? And think of this. Think of all the other things that these disciples now begin to think about and what is now real that Jesus told them in other places of scripture. Things like this. Peter, you're the rock and I'm gonna build my church on you. The gates of hell won't stand against you. Do you think Peter believes that now? Uh, Yeah, he actually said he was going to rise from the dead, and he rose from the dead. Now I guess I am the rock, and and, and the gates of hell won't stand against me. Things like, uh, you you know, it'll be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Nothing will be impossible for you. In my name, uh, where two or three are gathered, there I am. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. We can go on and on with the other things that Jesus taught them that now become alive. See what happens when you are actively engaged in scripture? It changes who we are, and we need to be confident in that. I put number one on your outline. If you're following along this morning, jot this thought down. I need to be confident in what Jesus taught us. And here's the thing. If you are confident in what Jesus taught us, you're going to take your Bible, and you're going to have enough confidence to actually study it. Now, I know, you know, you come to church and, you know, you're expecting a pastor to say, yeah, you you should study your Bible, right? That's kind of a platitude in the church. But listen, it's one of the biggest platitudes there should be, right? I I should, if if you come this morning thinking, oh, yeah, well, you know, study the Bible, whether that's old, old news. No, you know what? That's old news. 
But that's good news. And that's important news in the life of your spiritual growth. You know, those who are studying the word are those that are growing in the Lord. We, we, we've got to understand that these, these disciples, they're, they're atrophic or, or they're weakened because they didn't believe. They were slow of heart. They were slow learners. They weren't using their heads in scripture. But now, I want you to notice the next part of being convinced, how he convinces them. He proves his reality through the fish. Notice, go back to verse 39. He says, see my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me, see me. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed his hands and feet and they still disbelieved for joy, but they were marveling. And they said to him, have you anything else here to eat? Anything here to eat? And they gave them a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it. Now, there's that idea again, right? Food goes in, that's real. You might even look at, you know, you might even say that, that still could be a ghost. He could be f- fooling us. But when the food goes in, that means I've got a real throat, I've got a real stomach, I've got a real intestinal tract. He, he is alive. And so the good news of Jesus eating just a piece of fish here is twofold. Number one, he's alive. He actually rose. But I think for us as believers, there is another element of good news here. He gives us a glimpse of what the resurrected body looks like, right? Some of us, we have this picture kind of that when we die and we go to heaven, we're going to be, you know, sitting on a rock playing a a harp or some sort of angelic being, you know, floating around with wings or some stuff to say, you know, they're kind of like a spirit, you know, that you can put your hands through and see through. Like, you know, I grew up on Casper, the friendly ghost. Anybody here remember Casper, the friendly ghost? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. And so I'm kind of like a ghost-like figure floating from cloud to cloud. That is not the resurrected body that the Bible speaks about. And this is my humble opinion because when we come to even places like 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us an insight. People were wondering what the resurrected body was going to look like. They're asking the same questions. Am I gonna be a spirit? Am I gonna be floating around? What was, am I gonna be absorbed in the universe and karma? What am I going to be? But Paul gives us a very specific definition or or, or, a picture of what the resurrected body is like. And look at what he says. He says, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. For all of you who are in Christ, we will all die, but we will rise. And the body that is sown in the perishable, it will be raised imperishable. Okay, so the first part of the resurrected body, well, the first part of your body right now is that it's perishable. Do we know the difference between the perishables in a grocery store and the imperishables in a grocery store. So, so if you go to a grocery store, you know, today, this evening, we're going to have a turkey here this evening, right? If you come to the evening service, we'll put a turkey on the table. Is that a perishable or an imperishable? imperishable. Why? Because you don't want to eat that in three weeks from now. If it's just left out on the table, what's going to happen? It's going to start decaying and rotting and, and getting fuzzy stuff on it. And, and it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be consumable. But the imperishables in the grocery store are things like Top Ramen, right? <laughs> or Spam. <laughs> Think about Spam. I, I mean, Spam's amazing to me, you know? You can keep it in the can for a year, five years. Does Spam ever get bad? You know, in 20 years from now, you know, after the coming of the Lord, after the millennium, if you believe in the thousand-year reign, you can open up the cupboards and say, Lord, would you like some Spam? You know, and it'll be there and it'll be good. It's an imperishable. But the Bible says you are sown in the perishable. You are the rotting turkey right now, to put it as bluntly as possible. But you will be raised in that which will go on forever and ever and ever and will not decay. 
That is the resurrected body that we see in Jesus Christ, but this is the resurrected body that Paul describes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But not only is it sown in the perishable and raised in the imperishable, notice what else it says. It is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. And I love this idea of glory. The word here in the Greek is the word doxa, where we get doxology, which means absolute beauty or absolute glorious or absolute perfection. Now, I look out here and you all look glorious, okay? You are beautiful, but you're not perfectly beautiful. You're not absolutely beautiful. If I look at you close enough, I guarantee I can find faults. There is not a single person on this earth who is doxa, absolutely gloriously perfect, other than my wife, of course. I have to say that, man. (laughs) But the idea here is that we are all flawed. We are all imperfect in some ways. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, sinfully. We are imperfect. But the good news is is that when a new body that's raised is what? It's doxa. It's absolute beauty. Internally, externally, it is the perfect body that has been made, that God would have for us. That's the resurrected body. Notice what else it says. It's also uh, sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. As we get older, what happens to us? We become weaker and weaker, don't we? I mean, I used to be able to jump high. I used to be able to uh, run fast. I used to be able to do a lot of things that I can't do anymore. Now, you know, I go for a jog, and my body says, what? What? You know, you, you can't do this. You, you can't uh, do what you used to do. I'm like every car I used to have. You know, a, a car is when you get them and they're new, you push the gas and zoom. But then you, you know, get them 20 years down the road, you push the gas and they go, what? You know, like this isn't gonna happen. There's not a lot of power behind it. That's what happens to us. But when we are raised, our new bodies will be given in absolute power, not just physical power, but I think spiritual power as well. And then look at the last one. This is the best one of all. You're sown in a natural body, but then you will be raised, your new body will be raised in a spiritual one. And by the way, that's not meaning a translucent Casper, the friendly ghost kind of body that's spiritual. We we don't say that, right? I I wouldn't say over here that Joel, you know, if if I were to say Joel is a spiritual guy, our choir director, and you wouldn't come over here and try and put your hand through him or anything, would you? I mean, you would know exactly what I meant by being a spiritual guy. It means that he is a godly guy. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells the Corinthian church that they need to be more spiritual. And he says, you need to have the mind of Christ. And when you have the mind of Christ, you will be more spiritual. So when we're talking about we are raised in natural and flesh, but or when we, we're sown in natural or flesh, but when we are raised, we are raised in what? That which has the absolute mind of Christ, made in his glorious likeness, sharing his value, seeing the world as he wants us to see it. Isn't that a great concept? I'm looking forward to that new body, aren't you? I mean, as I get older, you know, I'm not that old yet. (laughs) I still, you know, Casper the friendly ghost, don't judge me on my age based on that. But I'm not that old yet. But as I get older, I think, man, that new body is looking better every day. (laughs) I I put it this way, uh, you you know, um, this new body is going to be similar, but altogether better. I like to illustrate the new body like this compared to the body that we have now. Suppose, you know, I like riding motorcycles. And and suppose, you know, there's a bunch of people here at this church who, a bunch of guys say, let's go for a ride and they say, we're going to bring all of our bikes, and we're going to go for a ride on a Saturday afternoon, and, and, and we're just going to take it out, and, you know, vroom, 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 vroom. you know, I love the noise of a motorcycle. I, I love the whole feeling of it. It feels good on a motorcycle, all the sparkles, all the shininess, all the chrome, yeah. And so I, I come to church and say, yeah, I can't wait to go for a ride. And there's about 10 people at church and they've got their Harley Davidsons like this or their BMWs or their other big powerful bikes and I come and I come riding up on this. (laughs) And they say, what are you doing? I say, we're going for a ride, right? You said, bring your bike. (laughs) 
I would say, I am. I brought my bike. It's got wheels, two of them. It's got spokes. It's got a nice banana seat. This is the, my bike that I had when I was in elementary school, by the way. And it, it's, got the, uh, it's got the handlebars. This is, uh, this is my ride. Similar, but altogether inferior. This is, uh, this is my huffy growing up. <laughs> Listen, you are a huffy right now, a, a, an imperfect. And what is prepared for you is so much better, that resurrected body. And when we see Jesus rising and eating fish, we are reminded of our resurrected body. I put number two on your outline. Jot it down this morning if you would. I need to rejoice when I think about my resurrected body or when I think about my future, however you want to do it. I, I, I think we could go even more specific, that not just about my future, but my specific resurrected body. That's the hope that we have, and that's what Paul was telling the church of Corinth as they were thinking about their future, you have a resurrected body. And that Christ rose from the dead means that we too will have this resurrected body. I love what D.L. Moody put uh, as he was aging. He said this, he said, someday you'll read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At that moment, I will be more alive than I am now. I shall have just gone up higher, that's all. Out of this old clay tenement, this, this house that I'm in now, it's old, it's ratty, it's clay into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like his glorious body. Praise the Lord that we are fashioned one day, that this is not it, this body that we have, that he will take the DNA of us and put it back together and create this glorious body for us. Now, last thing I want you to notice about our text this morning. There are three phrases in three different verses that I want to draw your attention to because Jesus repeatedly gives these phrases, I think, for us to really do some self-examination here this morning. It says in verse 31 that their eyes were opened. Verse 32, their hearts burned. Verse 45, their minds were opened to understand the scripture. Now, this is the trifecta, or three critical pieces to really being a follower of Jesus Christ, to being transformed, to being passionate about Christ, having these strengths. When your minds are open to understand Scripture, when, when your hearts are burning for Christ, when your eyes are open to see the reality of him in your life, that changes everything about your life. In fact, the opposite of this is also described in the Bible. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 42, 6 through 7, that the people had blinded eyes and they weren't able to follow the Lord properly. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 said the people had lukewarm hearts. And Jesus says, you've got to be hot or cold, but lukewarm, I'm spitting you out. And then Ephesians chapter 4 said that the people had darkened minds. See, when we come to this text, it's this idea of having opened eyes and burning hearts and minds open to the scriptures. When, when the disciples, they heard the teaching of Jesus and their minds were open to the scriptures, what happened? They were radically changed. They went from huddling and fearful and running to what? Fully embracing the gospel message and fully living under this, the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that one of the greatest things that we could pray for in our lives is not that we would stop sinning or or pray for other people, you know, that they would come to church. No, that's not the greatest thing. Or pray that we get a better job, or pray that we get this or that, or whatever it may be. You know what the greatest prayers that we can pray? Lord, open their minds and their hearts and their eyes to you. Open my mind and my eyes and my heart to you. In fact, do you realize this is what Paul prays to the Ephesians church? Look at what it says. 
He's looking at the Ephesians church and he says, I have a prayer for you. And here he picks it up and he says, I'm praying that you would have the eyes or the eyes of your heart would be enlightened that you may know, right? That's your mind. You may know the hope that he has called you to. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is immeasurable greatness of his power towards us to believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Do you want to start praying for your neighbors or praying for other people in your church? Pray that their eyes would be open to the realities of Christ. So important for our lives because that's what changed... What changed the disciples? Their eyes are open. And here's the thing. I think that many people, even in the church of Jesus Christ, around the globe, come in and go out every week, and their eyes are never really open. Even think about this, or or sometimes where our hearts get cold. Think about when you first came to know the Lord and you were opening the scripture and everything was jumping out on the page and you were going, oh, this is amazing. This is, this is incredible. This is mind-boggling. And then somewhere we kind of get a little, our minds aren't as active there. It's, it's, it's not engaged as much. We're, our hearts were once burning and it sort of fizzles out. We should be praying for one another. You love someone in the body of Christ here? You know what you should be praying for them? Lord, their minds would be open to know you. It's a great prayer for our lives. In fact, I don't know, have you, has anybody been following Kanye West lately? Yeah, he's been quite controversial, hasn't it? Kanye West recently gave his life to Christ. Now, if you were to look at the last 10 years of Kanye West's life, quite salacious indeed. Uh, You want to talk about everything that at church I would tell you not to do? Look at Kanye West. (laughs) You know, he is not the pillar of godliness by any means. In fact, I would say he's the antithesis of the pillar of godliness. But recently, he gave his life to the Lord And he started writing praise music, and he actually started doing church services, and he started doing things passionately for Christ. And people are trying to figure out, even in the church, like, is this real? What's really going on here? I don't know about this Kanye West guy. I don't know. How can a guy that has been so horrible his whole life now be so full on into Jesus? It's just not adding up. He's got to be doing it for another reason. Well, this interview I looked at, uh, I I watched this last week. It was James Corden, and uh, he was interviewing Kanye West on an airplane, and uh, he asked, he asked what a lot of people were thinking. He says, what do you say to people who say, I don't believe it? I don't believe in the awakening of Kanye. I don't believe that after looking at the last five years of his life, that this can be such day and night in his life. That one day, you would be living your life one way, and then the next day, you would be living your life in an entirely different way. That all of this that you're doing is for God and for faith. What would you say to that person? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, some of us would, might even want to ask that same question. How can someone who has lived a life this way, so different, now come and they follow Jesus and their life is radically, radically different? And their values are different. And they're saying different things. They're proclaiming different things. I love what Kanye West said. Listen closely. This is great. He said, I'd say this. When you go to sleep, would you agree that you're asleep when you're asleep? Yeah, yeah, I believe that. And then when you wake up, would you agree that you're awake when you're awake? Yeah, yeah. Would you agree that sleep and awake are two different states? People who don't believe are asleep. And this is the awakening. That is, I mean, that's it. He nails it. That's what the disciples are all about. Asleep. Mind closed, not just no burning heart. 
And then the same people, they're in a totally different state when you encounter Jesus for reals. Don't, don't you long for that even in your life? Hey, listen, I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, whether you're a baby Christian or whether you're a mature Christian. I want to be awakened to the reality of Christ in my life. And sometimes we need to be awakened. We need to pray for one another that we would be awakened as the body of Christ. Last thing in your outline, jot it down this morning. I put this. This meal reminds me I need to pray that I would be fully awakened. I need to pray that I would be fully awakened. And I would argue pray for one another that we would be fully awakened to the reality of Christ in our lives that we would be awakened to the scriptures, that our minds would become active, that our hearts would burn again for the Lord. Don't you love that this little merienda is how Jesus finishes? We've been talking about dinner the whole time. A piece of fish really awakens us. A little bit of bread to what Jesus wants to do in our life. And listen, if you're here this morning, And you want to be awakened, even like Kanye. And I can't speak to the reality of what's going on in Kanye's life. I can only repeat what he has said. But maybe you're here this morning and you're in a state of sleep and and you want to be transformed. You want to know about more of this Jesus. You you want to hear more. You want to know what, what we're talking about of being awakened and have this burning in our hearts for the things of God. I would challenge you not to leave this place without talking to someone about what that means and and, and how you can have that, whether it's myself or Pastor Noah or the prayer team that's over here after the service. Let's pray together. Lord, I do just pray for Union Church of Manila, my prayer for them for all of us is that our eyes of our hearts would be open that we may know the risen Lord. For every person in this congregation this morning, for the newest believer, I pray that they would just know you more, that you would show yourself to them, that they would see you And that would change their life forever, as you did with the disciples. For the believer who has been here and has been following you for 80 years, Lord, I pray the same thing. And Lord, for the people here who have don't know you at all, and maybe they're here wondering what all of this is about, I pray that they would wouldn't leave this morning without having their minds open to the things of you. And they would just have a new developed hunger for the things of you. And we ask this in your name. Amen.